So thank you folks for joining us today. Uh, as you know, this is part of the programming we're doing as the Peace and Justice Studies Association. We are doing three months of programming. Um, starting in September through October and November, we have moved our physical conference to an online conference. Today, we are lucky enough to start off our November series of programming. Uh, each month was focused on a particular theme. So in September, we focused on restorative justice. Uh, in October, we focused on narrative and storytelling. And now that it's November, uh, we are focusing on polarization. And so today is the first event in a series of month-long events which will focus on polarization. If you're interested in joining other sessions, the schedule is online and the ticket that you use to access this today will uh, allow you into any session throughout the month. And so I just wanted to, to do a few things. I wanna kind of welcome you to the space. I wanna give us a brief introduction to the topic and then I want to, to pass the, the microphone over. And so, Oh, and the first thing I'll say is we can actually, as of this week, start talking about, and although this sounds very odd, next year's conference. Um, so for folks who are regular attendees of PJSA, um, we have now secured both a location and a date, uh, assuming that this um, you know, Zoom um, COVID hellscape ends between now and then. Uh, we plan to meet at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee on uh, September 24th to September 26th. So I will start uh, repeating that frequently. Okay, so just to start us off with a few things, right? Today's, today we're focused on polarization, as I said, but we're focused specifically on polarization as it relates to uh, environmental conflict and some other uh, ecologically themed issues. The panel is officially called Polarization in a Time of Misinformation and Political Strife, Water, Climate, and Radical Eco-Social Change. What we're going to be doing is speaking to three people, um, although I didn't clear this title with us, I think we would all describe ourselves as somewhere between uh, scholars and activists. Sometimes people use the term scholar activist, uh, but we all both you know, write and uh, work in academic settings occasionally and then work uh, within social movements. And so the three of us are going to provide what we hope is a, a somewhat um, engaging discussion. So as opposed to de delivering in a sense papers we have a series of questions which we're gonna work through and uh, respond. And then we wanna make this as interactive as, uh, as we're able. Luckily, I know of a fair number of people on this call, um, so we can hopefully feel more able to engage. So I wanted to, again, thank you for joining. I wanted to remind us that not only are we being joined today by the, the 25 or 30 of us who are here, but that these are being recorded and put online um, already, we've gotten a lot of great feedback, so we know that our sessions are being used online um, pretty well. So, um, with that, I want to just provide a brief introduction to the to what we're actually talking about, right? The, the, the topic, not just the the function of the of the conference itself. But today, as we said, we're talking about polarization, and I wanted to frame polarization in, in just a few ways, right? Um, Oftentimes we think of it as this as, as political polarization, right? Whether it's Democrat, Republican, conservative, liberal, or whatever dichotomies we want to use. Um, but I want to think of it, uh, or rather, the way I think about it frequently is a slightly different notion of in-group and out-group. Um, and so I, I, I don't think this is contradictory framing, but I, but I want to kind of use this framing. And actually, I was flipping through a text I really like, and I'll just read from it for a second. Um, so this is from a book. Uh, focused on political extremism that came out last year, but but I and they're talking about social movements and how people join them. The author, whose last name, whose name is Berger, says, "quote The act of joining a movement. He's talking about a social movement. Right? The act of joining a movement is an assertion of identity, and thus membership in a movement always begins with the statement of we believe, or simply we are. The most basic element of collective identity is the in group, the people who belong." In-groups often form organically based on obvious connections. For instance, people who are born and live in Boston may consider themselves Bostonians. Not everyone who lives in a place will identify with a local collective, but it's an easy, obvious, and typically useful identity. So how is this relevant to what we're talking about? Well, well there's a number of ways in which we can, we can look at this. We can split people very much into simple in-group, out-groups on the issue of climate, right? We have so-called uh, climate change activists and climate deniers, right? We, have, we, we can position people based on how we expect them to engage with a particular topic. 
The other way we can do it is along the, the kind of classic ways we think of polarization. Again, whether it's political party, whether it's gender, whether it's nationality, where, whether it's citizenship and non-citizen, et cetera, et cetera. We know for a fact that climate violence, right, that climate change and climate violence leads to socio-political violence, right? We know that increases in, in, uh, in temperature overall and increases to um, stability of, of climates leads to, for example, an increase in domestic violence as well as uh, other forms of interpersonal violence. So what we're trying to look at today is this, uh, this, this balance between the structural, right? Because climate change is a structural issue. It's not, a, it's not an individual issue. So we're looking at this, the kind of structural nature of climate. And then we're looking also, at least for, from my perspective, at how that relates more to the interpersonal, how that can relate to the institutional, and how that can relate to different systems of both um, resiliency and violence. Right? We know that polarization can lead us towards these forms of violences, that these polarizations can lead us to, for example, increased interpersonal violence. So my, my personal hope, is that people can take some of these discussions and move beyond the simple conversations of avoiding violence and moving us towards the more basic, um, the more basic work of creating positive peace. And th those who are, who are familiar with the, the kind of positive peace concept will just abide me for a second, but there is the notion that um, frequently the conflicts we engage in seek to reduce violence, right? What um, John Paul Lederach calls negative peace. So you know, decreasing the rate of climate change is negative peace. But fostering an environment in which we can grow sustainably would be what we call positive peace. So that's the perspective that I kind of begin with, is how do we use um, climate as the topic, acknowledging that it's an extremely polarizing topic, and allow it to move us towards positive peace. Um, I'll allow the other two um, folks who are joining us today to introduce themselves um, and let me just say that um, I'm wearing a number of, of hats in this capacity. So one, uh, I didn't say my name, my name is Michael Lodenthal, uh, but I serve as the Executive Director of uh, the Peace and Justice Studies Association, as well as one of the contributors and editors to the book uh, that brought us here, um, which is this book, which I have, which I'm not very good at promoting stuff, but this is, this is how the three of us have come to work together. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> we all have it. Um, and so the book's called From Environmental Loss to Resistance. And uh, we're bringing this panel today in a sense as a book talk, but also as a discussion based around these themes. So with that, I want to pass uh, it over to my co-editor, Lee, who is going to frame the session a bit for us. Um, great, thanks. Um, hi everyone, thanks for having us here today. Um, I've, I've worked with Michael and Zoe in different contexts now for several years um, and uh, it's great to have us all here together and we did all, yes, participate in this book which um, <laughs> was actually a really uh, beautiful experience uh, in the end to have finally come together for us. It was a tough one in many ways. Um, so that said, I'm going to just reiterate uh, a little bit of what Michael said, talk more a little bit about polarisation and how political polarisation connects to environmental polarisation, um, issues around depolarisation and then maybe leading toward a conversation that can focus on aspects of positive peace. Uh, so it's ironic in a way that we're here in a class about peacemaking to talk about polarization at the most polarized moment in the history of the United States, where we're effect, uh, experiencing both effective political polarization in that people are increasingly, uh, increasingly dislike and distrust those from other political parties and or social movements and uh, elite polarization, meaning where People are following the ideology of their party leaders more so than ever. And polarization is also complex, as Michael was describing. In reality, most, most people support mixes of sort of liberal and conservative views and policies, even though politicians reliably only sort of put forward a face toward one ideological side. Many people also hold really radical views, both on the left and the right, and prefer politicians to do that as well. But polarised representatives uh, of both political and social parties can 
also represent non-polarised groups. So there's also evidence in the US that popular attitudes about environmental problems are shaped by elite polarisation. But this is usually, usually, funnily enough, only holds true in the context of sort of left-wing views that are associated in support of environmental protections. But all this, what, what this all suggests is that pol how polarisation plays out is messy at best. So today we're going to delve a little further into how polarisation connects to issues such as environmental policies, law, activism and our infrastructure systems, uh, sort of riffing off what we talked about in the book, uh, and also the role of communication and messaging, uh, how that plays in creating chaos and polarisation. So we know, as Michael said, that we tend to gravitate into groups. Once we form a group, we tend to develop hostile feelings toward out groups. And this is all part of the social identity theory that sort of ranges across a lot of what we're talking about today. So we sort our value systems and ontological differences and opposing worldviews through as Michael was saying, racial and gender and age bias and religious and urban rural divides and all kinds of ways that contribute to situations in which outgroups are often considered the repugnant cultural other. So we're experiencing this now uh, through our partisan beliefs as they've become a litmus test uh, for our interpersonal relationships, our families, our friendships, our online networks. Um, so this, this is both cultivated and has a profound effect on media uh, and as a result we've, we're becoming more and more polarised and also homogenous in terms of how we receive and respond to information. And of course social media and news become echo chambers for that that reinforce our worldviews and our biases and as Michael was also saying one of the most obvious examples of that sort of um, misinformation in a lot of cases is in regard to climate change. So we can link hundreds of millions of dollars of fossil fuel industry funding to climate change denial. It's highly influ influential in lobbying. It funds a lot of political campaigns that results in protections for the industry through subsidies and policies and backing of elected officials who spout denialism. Um, climate change misinformation is written into school test textbooks published by the Heritage Foundation, which is a right wing think tank that's largely backed by uh, fossil fuel industry. And uh, they also back a lot of political donors, conservative uh, politicians. So um, these textbooks are now uh, infiltrating every middle and high school curriculum in the US. And meanwhile, internet trolls uh, propagate climate change denial throughout our social media landscapes. And that's something that I talked about in a previous panel with Michael. Um, but today I want to move from that and talk about other undercurrents that connect environmental messaging to infrastructure and politics for example, issues surrounding the health of our local water system and systems and how we perceive and litigate against eco-activism and even what we think of uh, infrastructure uh, projects like the US-Mexico border wall. And the wall is a really great example of how political polarisation is produced for a greater purpose, meaning how narratives are crafted, polished and distributed to obfuscate, obfuscate underlying ties between ideology, financial interests and policy. So in the case of the border wall, messaging is designed to elicit fear by connecting immigration narratives to xenophobia and racism. You know, they're drug dealers, they're rapists and murderers, they steal our jobs, they're coming to drain our healthcare system. And chaos is an active agent in this sort of messaging. We're predisposed to chaos when we suffer from social isolation and discontent. Chaos relates to interplays between status seeking and states of social exclusion and can be attributed in large part to rising inequality. And this may be one of the factors that explains why Trumpism is so successful in the US and gaining traction elsewhere. Chaos helps to produce the perception of a southern border crisis and thus paves the way for disaster capitalism to flourish. So in the case of the border wall, we have political and ec economic gain that are achieved by advancing selective immigration policies alongside securitizing border regimes. So polarization and chaos act together to produce a hostile form of infrastructure in the service of the accumulation of capital. So as we're 
experience this distraction by the polarization and chaos circulating around the immigration rhetoric, the process of accumulation by disposition, meaning the profiting from the seizure of lands, of rights, of resources, and even people through detention, moves forward. So, of course, the border wall existed before Trump and he didn't even build that much of it. Um, but what has happened under his administration is an amplification of the chaos in concert with more overt political rhetoric that heightens partisan divides in an already extremely polarised environment. And as chaos intensifies and distracts, political and economic stakeholders profiteer from the situation which is what I meant earlier when I was, uh, mentioned disaster capitalism, which is a practice of government taking advantage of a major disaster to adopt neoliberal policies that the public, that we would be less likely to uh, or willing to accept under normal circumstances or under less chaotic or polarised circumstances. So the point that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make is that Polarisation and chaos aid in an underlying goal of profit making or profiteering and that here we can start to see feedback loops between political and corporate actors. So to go back to the uh, border wall example, Trump's family separation or zero tolerance policy demonstrates how hardline nativist ideology aligns with right wing nationalism for the purpose of profiting from humanitarian fallout. So how does it happen? Well, as early as 2018, private contractors uh, ha had been pa have been paid around one and a half billion dollars to hold, house and feed thousands of children forcibly separated from their families and placed in camps. Bethany Christian Services, tied to outgoing Education Secretary Betsy DeVos, charged $700 per child per night to rehome some of these kids in foster care. And the DeVos family, of course, is has long been influential in Christian conservatism and Republican politics. And that's just one organisation. About a dozen contractors operate more than 30 facilities in Texas alone, with numerous others uh, contracted for about 100 shelters in 16 other states. And if we follow the money around the wall itself, we see that the... That the um, federal government authorises numerous um, legal waivers to circumvent environmental and cultural laws like environmental impact studies, land rights treaties and conservation area protections to fast track the construction of the wall and the panopticon technologies to surveil it that sort of goes along with it in, in a, opening up these trillion dollar profit making opportunities for commercial actors. And if we look at the key investors just in Sterling Construction alone, that's a company that won the contract to build the physical wall, we see Bannon, Trump, Pence um, have all uh, either substantially um, benefited from direct or in, in indirect investment ties to Sterling Construction, as has other major players in his sort of satelliting universe. Uh, people like Robert Mercer, who's a major Trump donor and CEO, co-CEO of Renaissance, who's a significant shareholder of Sterling. The same is true of other major investors, including CEOs of BlackRock, JP Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo and Dimensional, all of who profited enormously from investments in this construction company as their share prices soared following the awarding of the contract. In counterpoint, of course, you have all these lawsuits that are filed to contest the expansion of the wall by the California Coastal Commission, the ACLU, Center for Biological Diversity, and an array of, uh, of alliances of city governments, tribal nations, and others who join for, have joined forces to oppose it. So we can discern that these sorts of polarized political and social realities and cultural discourses about power and control and ultimately profit have profound consequences, especially for poor and marginalised groups who live with environmental injustices and dangerous and hostile forms of infrastructure investment that result in communities not only being ripped apart, but in the tragedy of ecocide. So how do we engage in depolarisation in ways that go beyond reinforcing neoliberalism? Uh, we have ideas about how to cultivate awareness or social cohesion and engaged action. Um, how do we counter the deepening despair that we, that we associate with the stress and psychological traumas of environmental loss and 
time of acute polarisation and the time of acute accumulation by dispossession? How do our communications address what, both what people need and what they want to know, which is a big problem to bridge? So the socioeconomic circumstances that people face can often determine how they absorb information. When people are stressed, it may impair their decision-making capabilities. People need time to recover from trauma and may deprioritize or respond poorly to information that points to more future traumas, as in the case of encountering extreme weather events associated with climate change. And this is known as a finite pool of worry theory. We also need to keep in mind that people look for facts <laughs> that fit their worldviews and that they can often turn to misinformation to do so. Our community peers, as Michael was saying when he was talking about in-groups, are more likely to determine what we believe rather than any amount of scientific evidence that we're presented with. So we know certain forms of communication uh, resonate more broadly with conservatives. And if we're interested in developing a, a bridging discourse, we can talk about things like a safe, secure and healthy future. Um, you know, when we're talking about uh, renewables to conservatives, we can also talk about the industrial revolution and rather than demonizing it, recognizing it as a great achievement and correlating it to the new opportunities offered by renewables. We can also talk about resilience and security because they're core center right values. You know, the future security that rests on renewable energy sources and how they'll provide a safe, secure, long term job security security for engineers and technicians and labourers and this is a language that speaks to efficiency and productivity and it's important because it changes our mode of production even though it fails to address the underlying structural problem that's presented by capitalist paradigm which is perpetual growth so but still to move forward using bridging language that resonates with both conservative and liberal mindsets is necessary if we want to depolarize our conversations. When it comes to climate change, we can talk about, um, you know, we can we can talk about landscape and countryside to conservatives because conservatives tend to value the the aesthetic beauty of nature. So this is a way of anchoring a wider conversation about climate change. We can talk about new dangers uh, because climate policies may seem to threaten the, the status quo, which is a big concern for centre-right people. But climate impacts are a bigger threat. So people are starting to recognise that. And if we talk about things like responsible courses of action, and risk aversion, that's a language that really penetrates. Um, and people are more likely to endorse your argument. And moving on from that, we do all share one common belief, and that is it's important to preserve the environment for future generations. So all this indicates that one of the most, in my mind, one of the most uh, persuasive arguments for addressing anthropologically induced issues and crises is humanist in nature. Similar to environmental justice, a core premise of eco-humanism is that a healthy natural environment and access to nature is essential to maintaining a good quality of life, human health, economic prosperity, social well-being, eco ecological protections, all sort of form this big uh, bubble of what we have come to know as One Health. Um, so how do we communicate effectively about the very complex and specific uh, issues associated with resource loss and degradation, trauma and recovery and restorative justice? So these are some of the questions I'd like to now pose back to uh, my colleagues. Um, and I, I'd like to start with you, Zoe. Um, you work in the water sector and you told me that one of the top bipartisan issues for many people on a national level is water and water infrastructure. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, and thank you for having me. Um, it, it may be surprising that water is such a bipartisan, broadly popular issue, given that other environmental issues are so divided. But for a long time in this country, environmental issues were generally fairly bipartisan. Um, and things like the, the fact that the EPA was created under Richard Nixon 
So Republican and Democratic administrations both had a hand in passing environmental policies. Um, and the caveat with that is that all US environmental policy takes place in the context of colonialism and environmental injustice. So the two parties don't represent many of the people that are most harmed by environmental issues, but um, environmental policy was generally something that crossed party lines in the past. But that changed in the last few decades, partly because as Lee said, oil companies put a lot of money into controlling the discourse, particularly around climate change and making it into a much more partisan issue than it was before that. Um, but somehow water has kind of escaped that. It's remained an issue that has a lot of support on both sides of the aisle. Um, there was a survey conducted last year by an organization called the Value of Water Campaign, and they found that people's number one priority across all issues was rebuilding the country's infrastructure. And that beat out things like immigration, healthcare policy, terrorism. So you really see that across parties and regions and demographics, people are strongly in favor of investing in water infrastructure. Um, even as infrastructure itself is sometimes seen as kind of a, a democratic priority, although Trump diverged from that model a bit, um, but water does enjoy very broad support. And I think that's partly because water issues affect everyone to some extent, although they affect vulnerable communities like people of color and ind indigenous people much more severely. But it is an issue that people can connect to. Um, there are also pretty widespread water challenges in rural areas, which are often more Republican strongholds. So that may be part of why it, it has a more bipartisan appeal. Um, but I think it's important to stress that water is an environmental justice issue and that it is vulnerable people who are being disproportionately affected by things like water quality challenges, water scarcity, and the climate related or water related impacts of climate change. So the fact that there's mainstream support for water policies is really promising. And it's an entry point for environmental justice focused policies to gain broad support. Uh, you also told me that there's an institutional tendency to provide sort of blanket or to engage with blanket messaging uh, when when trying to communicate to to communities about their water systems and we know from research in terms of talking about climate change it's better to integrate these sort of best case worst case narratives about environmental issues uh, into a single storyline so we don't have a utopian or dystopian sort of messaging but um, we have a sort of a more measured uh, uh, form of communication that, that's, I guess, more believable. Is that also the case when you're messaging people about water systems or what is the most effective way that you see as getting your message across? Well, the, the challenge with communicating around water is a little bit different, but it, it is difficult to separate from climate change because so many of the climate challenges that we face our experience through water, whether it's flooding, storms, drought, um, climate and water are often very connected issues. But one of the major challenges around communicating water issues that water systems in this country face is that they're very technical and the way that they function is pretty obscure to most people. And that's the way that water systems have always operated. They see themselves as a silent service that operates behind the scenes their pipes are underground, and it's kind of a, a mysterious thing how water gets into people's houses and how it gets treated. So they have a very difficult time communicating the value of water and infrastructure and the need for water rates and investment in water systems. Um, so I think there does need to be a move towards communicating more actively and demystifying the services that they provide. But a big issue with that, and I might be jumping to one of your next questions, but it's very difficult to communicate that when people don't trust the messenger. Um, and there, there's such a broad distrust in government institutions generally in this country, particularly in water systems over the last few years as a result of things like the Flint water crisis and other water contamination issues like algae blooms in the Midwest and nitrates related to agriculture runoff in the West. Um, so public trust in water is fairly low and that means that even if water systems are communicating openly and clearly, people may not trust it because of where it's coming from. And, and how do you, um, 
how do you see you could start addressing that in the types of ways that you, you know, are working with these different communities and government sectors? I mean, is it is it a matter of continuing to try and educate the general public or is it more a matter of trying to educate the institutions that you're working with? Yeah, I think it's both. Um, I think the starting point is just recognizing that people's distrust in institutions is completely legitimate and rational, and it's based on historical experiences and continuing experiences of government harming vulnerable communities and not having people's best interests at heart. Um, things like the histories of colonialism in this country, structural racism, mass incarceration, police violence, environmental justice communities where um, sites that were known to be very dangerous were placed close to communities. There are countless examples of why people would have distrust in government agencies. And even when it's not necessarily the water system itself that has engaged in those practices, I think the larger distrust of government affects them. So the first step to having any kind of trusting relationship with communities is to acknowledge all of that harm that has been done and to avoid becoming defensive about it. Um, and just to recognize how, how deep that harm was, how people were affected, and that people's distrust is coming out of self-preservation and that it's a very rational response. So I think once institutions start to accept that and to accept responsibility for the rebuilding of trust that they need to do, that is the first step to having better communication. Um, and it is a question of there are things that communities could learn about the ways that infrastructure functions, but there's also a lot that water systems themselves stand to learn about how utilities or how communities experience their services, what kinds of challenges they're dealing with and what kind of experiences and knowledge they have that the water system itself isn't able to know. Um, so I think a really important part of communicating around water related environmental issues is doing it in partnership with communities and community organizations themselves. Michael, I want to ask you a question. What, I'm going to ask you a question and then a follow-up question. So my question is also to do with institutional trust. Um, what you deal with in, in sort of two, two diverging parts of the work that you do. One is as in, you know, your involvement with sort of eco-activism or however you want to sort of frame that um, sort of part of your life. And the other side, which is sort of like the institutional work that you do as a professor or, you know, your work with PJSA. And so I'm just wondering how the interfaces with institutional trust sort of those dynamics work with you in those in those two roles. And, um, and then after that, I'm going to ask you something more about sort of the, the political climate of eco-activism and sort of more specifics around that. So, but first, if you could just talk more about general uh, institutional trust as it relates to you and these different hats that you wear. Yep. I'm happy to, to talk about that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, I, I, I occupy a, a relatively unique position specifically in regards to this conversation. So I began, um, I, I, I never, I should say this, I never intended to be a college professor. Um, <laughs> never like- Me either. <laughs> yeah, it was never like something I, I thought of doing. Um, and actually when I finished my master's work, I had done a large scale quantitative study of the folks we're talking about, environmental, well, the folks I'm talking about rather, environmental direct action individuals. So people who are breaking the law operating in clandestine networks in order to uh, achieve some sort of environmental goal. So I'd been researching these, these movements for, for quite a long time. I had some friends and colleagues who were kind of tied up in them. Um, and in the post 9-11 rush to call everyone a terrorist, uh, some of them got caught up in that criminalization. When I finished graduate school, I ended up uh, in Washington, uh, DC, which is where I'd been living and um, was looking for work. I was gonna go back to bartending. Um, and a Georgetown professor reached out to me and said, hey, why don't you teach, you know, try your hand at teaching. And so I developed this course on terrorism, focused on, on these movements, and it was successful enough that, that we continued doing it. And 10 years later, I'm still doing it. And so I, I, I kind of provide that vignette as a bit of, a, a, as a bit of a, an example of, of the ways in which I've kind of come upon these. So I've worked 
frequently uh, providing defense for social movements engaged in what we'll call uh, environmental um, environmental activism. And by defense, I mean a number of things. Um, sometimes this is um, helping to author texts, so you know, verbal defense. Um, I do a lot of uh, background writing for for media. Um, sometimes this is physical defense, right? We've worked with a number of, for example, forest encampments in um, in the UK as well as in North America, building um, physical blockade sites to prevent, uh, for example, pipelines being uh, built or to prevent trees from being felled for the purpose of building pipelines. Uh, some of this has been legal defense, right? I, um, I've done a lot of work researching how activists are prosecuted and charged. Um, so looking at just those three capacities, the kind of rhetorical defense, the physical defense, um, and in a sense, the, the legal and, and political defense, I often have to be very careful of which hat I'm wearing when. Right, this moment in, in this um, Zoom seminar, you know, is a good example where I'm wearing the hat of both a professor of, of um, peace studies at Georgetown as well as the executive director of um, of PJSA. And and a lot of the experiential knowledge I'm bringing to the table comes from neither of those. Right, it comes from my work as a as a, for lack of a better word, frontline activist. Um, so I feel like I'm constantly switching between those roles. Um, and there's a number of trust issues <laughs> that both I have and, and, and my colleagues have. Um, so for one, uh, the activists I work with, you know, don't trust most people and, and rightfully so, just, just I don't mean to, to make that flippant. Um, but you know, activists don't tend to trust institutions um, because most of those institutions have pretty explicit corporate ties or state ties um, as, as Lee was speaking earlier about the, the funding. There's also the notion that you know the general public, so the people were you know doing the rhetorical defense for the people who are consuming the the newspapers that we're trying to convince them through. Um, you know, a, a lot of those people, the general public, they don't trust activists or academics. So if we're splitting that to a false camp, you know, they see the activists as uh, single-minded, and they see the professors as biased. Um, the amount of times I have been called a biased professor has, has sort of escaped me to count at this point. Um, and, and again, I, I, you know, I've written on this academically. I've, I've theorized about why I think, you know, quote unquote, objectivity is not only impossible, but not desirable. Um, and, and I've kind of, at various times, to varying degrees, refused to play the game of pretending that I don't have views on topics. I don't endorse political candidates. That, that's not what we're talking about. But, but I do make it pretty clear that you know I, I, I support movements that are trying to increase justice. I'm not like, well, you know, I'm neutral on the issue of justice. Like, no, like I, I'm pro justice. Like, I, I think that's an okay position to be in. Um, and so, going back to, to to you know the central question, I think it comes down to a question of of trust within institutions. So I need the institution to trust me that I'm not going to be some sort of like, you know radicalizing agent for you know eco saboteurs i need the eco saboteurs to trust me that i have their interests in mind and i'm helping them develop legal strategy or i'm interviewing them for for research um, you know i need members of the of the media or policymakers to trust me that i have a general interest of 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 security in mind and all three of those require highlighting different parts of who i am and, and what i and what i'm offering um, you know, even the focus on security. So when I'm talking to one group of people, I'll focus on human security. When I'm focusing on another community, I'll focus on security for non-human animals in the environment. When I'm speaking to other groups of people, I will start by, by, by um, challenging the traditional notion of security, the so-called state security, and then, um, and then working back from there. So all of these things require kind of different foundations to speak from and, and different evidences to cite. So I'd say that kind of navigating those institutional things is a constant challenge. Um, and if I think of myself just in those three roles, right? Activist Michael, uh, Professor Michael, and for lack of a better word, NGO Michael. Those are, those are not necessarily overlapping identities. They're, they're intersecting for sure. But in the, mm -hmm. in the Venn diagram that is me, um, some of those are, are not overlapping. Yeah. That was the longer answer I meant to give.
Yeah, well, it, it certainly resonates with me. I, I share a lot of those thoughts. Um, I, I want to ask you something else which relates to that but maybe takes a step back and goes back to some of what you wrote about in the book and what I've heard you speak about in the past, and I hope this isn't just reiterating what you've spoken about before to um, your students, but um, like the, the, I guess the, the perception of one person's eco-activist is another idea of it, it's someone else's idea of an eco-terrorist. So in terms of these sort of narratives and political rhetoric um, and, you know, how they play on policies and punishments and so forth, how we construct ideas around what eco-activism is or what an eco-activist is and as a consequence what that means in terms of legal frameworks or prosecutions. Right. So that, I mean, that's a really important question. Um, I've written a lot about this, so it's, it's always hard for me to kind of think about where to, where to kind of answer a question of this nature, but, but I think we can look, you know, if, if we can say, Popular notions of history tell us that environmental activism kind of rises to prominence late 1960s, early 1970s. It, it, in a sense, it becomes, uh, it operates on a relatively, and I say relatively, because I, I don't mean um, that it's free of, of disturbance, but relatively uh, free to operate throughout the 70s and 80s and 90s, with, with the, the somewhat ex caveat exception of the anti-nuclear movement receiving far more repression than it, than it should have. But once we get to the late 1990s and the early 2000s, what we see is that there, there becomes a very intentional effort by um, multinational corporations to reframe environmental activism as something different than other forms of activism, right? Again, it's, it's not as if there's not other activists that exist in this time period. We have, you know, very militant groups. Let's say, for example, ACT UP, which is, you know, pushing, um, you know, AIDS awareness and, and HIV, AIDS and HIV awareness and activism. We have, you know, groups like, I don't know, the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society, which is, you know, scuttling whaling boats and putting landmines to sink uh, uh, whaling fleets. You know, it, it's not as if, and, and just, just to look at a radically different example, we have groups like, you know, we have the anti-abortion movement who in the 1980s, 1990s is on a somewhat regular basis murdering abortion providers and engaging in other forms of, 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 uh, of violence. And so it's not as if there are social movements which lack violence, but in the 1990s, there becomes a very measured effort, and, and I can point to the, the who and the what, but to frame environmental direct action movements, and by direct action, I mean groups which are not engaged in lobbying or marching, but are, are largely focused on damaging and disrupting property and, and capital, there becomes an effort to demonize them in a very different way. Now this begins prior to 9-11, but 9-11 provides it all of the fuel that it needs, right? 9-11 is an extreme catalyst for um, the defamation of this movement. And, and more than defamation, the framing of these movements as um, not protest movements, not movements of dissent, not movements seeking justice, not movements seeking et cetera, but movements that are terroristic in nature, movements which actually um, challenge the national security of the United States. And so starting in the early 2000s, we have you know, the, the, the FBI and the United States Attorney's Office and other entities. Um, this gets really bad under, um, under Alberto Gonzalez, uh, but we have a number of, of government entities you know, parroting the same line, which is that illegal forms of environmental protest, um, which the which corporate interests began calling, and then the government parroted quote eco-terrorism. So just to be clear, that's a corporate term, which was then adopted by the government. Um, but what we saw in this era through congressional testimony and FBI rhetoric is that the 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 United States security establishment advocated in a really explicit way that radical environmental and animal rights groups constituted a, a security threat. And if you look at you know comments made by the by senators as well as the director of the FBI at the time, uh, Director Lewis, they say that you know the FBI act sorry that the FBI that the Animal Liberation Front and the Earth Liberation Front, the kind of um, more famous of these group uh, groups or networks, constitute the number one domestic terrorist threat. That's a verbatim quote: number one domestic terrorist threat. Now again, that's sort of a laughable assertion because you know these movements have never killed people, and you know all the, you know many of the other movements I've cited have. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why it's a laughable statement, but one of the things that we see is that the climate in which activists 
engage in has shifted around them. In, in other words, the forms of environmental activism have stayed relatively uniform, right? There's legalistic marches and petitioning and all these sorts of you know, policy work, and then there's illegal underground direct action. All of which, you know, and, and the latter hasn't gotten more or less militant or destructive, right? That's maintained a pretty regular basis up until today. But what we have seen is the way in which it's framed, the way in which it's uh, treated by the state has radically changed. And just so we're clear, when the state's framing changes, the resulting action changes. So when the state's able to call these groups terrorists, they're able to use counterterrorism resources against them. So it's not just a defamatory framing, it's an entire counterinsurgency and counterterrorism strategy, which is used to challenge a particular social movement beginning in the late 1990s and arguably continuing um, into today with its height being about 10 years behind us or 15 years behind us. And the, um, the penalties as such is part of that framework then, yeah. right? So the penalties, from, yeah. yeah. The penalties have, have really changed. Um, the, the, there's a lot of different ways you can look at that. I think the best and, and, and the most telling way is to look at state level laws. So for example, the state of Pennsylvania where I'm from uh, passed a <coughs> state level eco-terrorism law you know, specifically looking at that. And, and this speaks to a larger issue, which, which, which I think is really important for people to understand, you know, really thoroughly. Um, arson, for example, is illegal, right? It's illegal to set fire to things that you don't own, just so we're all on the same page. Uh, <laughs> however, arson, which has a political objective, is policed and prosecuted in a different way. If that if the target of that arson is an animal industry. There's other exceptions to this. So let me say it this way. If you set fire to a, um, a McDonald's, right? Because that particular McDonald's franchise is owned by someone you don't like, right? A coworker you don't like, your, your neighbor who you know, always puts their trash out too early or, or whatever. You're angry at someone, you set fire to the franchise of McDonald's they own. That's a, that's a count of arson. Let's say you do it in, in Philadelphia. Um, so the state of Pennsylvania will charge you with arson. If you burn down the same McDonald's in the exact same location owned by the exact same person, but you leave a leaflet behind that says, I did this because you know, McDonald's is an evil corporation that's um, you know, constantly doing bad things to the environment and animals. And you set the same fire. That moves from an act of arson prosecuted by the state of Pennsylvania to an act of terrorism prosecuted by the United States government. Uh, it allows the, the government to use a statute, a federal statute, known as the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, the AETA, uh, which was passed in 2006, which was a mm, counterterrorism um, version of a, a law ironically called the Animal Enterprise Protection Act, passed in 1992. Um, now, whereas this law hasn't been used a lot, it hasn't been successfully prosecuted a lot, it, it does something really insidious, which is it takes something which is already illegal, arson, and, and any other crime, not just arson, but arson is the easiest example, I think. It takes something that's already illegal and it makes it more illegal based on the motive, right? So it says that because you did this for an environmental reason, it's thus terroristic and thus more illegal. Now, again, we don't have that for other things. We do have somewhat, we do have other laws which are focused around reason, um, but very few of them. So for example, and, and most of them are civil rights laws. So for example- Like hate laws or something. Yeah. So like you can't burn down a church uh, for the purpose of preventing someone from exercising their religion. That's a civil rights and hate crime violation. You can't block an abortion clinic um, for the purpose of denying someone the right to abortion. That's a violation of the FACE Act. There, there's a couple other examples, but the, the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, the AETA, provides a really clear example for, for this. And we can talk about it a bit later, but how that law is formed through a state corporate nexus is, is really telling for whose interest it protects. Um, well, so I guess on, on that, I'll, I'll sort of switch courses and go to something maybe that's not quite as, as um, complex to talk about uh, for a minute. Well, maybe it is. I don't know. Um, um, but to go back I to... Could, yeah, I wanted to ahead. jump in and ask a question in response to what Michael talked about, if that's okay. Yeah. 
Cool. Michael, I'm curious how you, if you see a shift in public perception of eco-activism in light of Standing Rock and the other pipeline movements, because it seems like the government response has been very similar as it was to earlier eco-activism in the 90s, like surveillance, criminalization, classifying it as terrorism, using a lot of insidious methods to try to undermine and punish those movements. Um, but I get the sense that while the public response to earlier forms of eco-activism might have been to see it as really fringe or kind of a joke, the, the government strategy has been less effective this time around in changing public opinion and that the framing of pipeline protesters as water protectors was really effective in gaining them a lot more public sympathy. Is that how you've seen it play out? Yeah, I would say that's exactly, that's actually a really good summation of it. I think that the treatment in the law and through, and through policing has been the same. These movements are heavily surveilled. They're heavily infiltrated. Um, the government, uh, specifically the FBI, sees them as a major security risk. Um, one of my like main uh, hobby is a weird way of saying it, but a, a hobby, I guess you'd say, is reading all of the kind of leaked and internal police reports and intelligence reports that talk about these movements. And the way in which, you know, for example, two people locking themselves to a bulldozer to prevent that bulldozer from, you know, chopping or felling trees that day, you know, the way that act of nonviolent civil disobedience is described in FBI and intelligence documents as dangerous uh, eco-terrorism is, is to me disingenuous because, you know, I think that's, that's not true. So I think that, the, as you said, the policing, the framing of it by the state has been, has been pretty similar. And if, if, if anything else has gotten somewhat worse. Um, but I think that the general public is, is more open to it. I, I, I agree with you that the, the turn of a phrase water protector, as opposed to like pipeline blockader, real smart. Um, I think that, you know, and it actually gets to the point. I think there's been a number of long-standing uh, tree sits, for example, and other long-term blockades, which people have been able to get behind. I think there has been a decline in some of the very atypical, but still occurring more scary things. So for example, in the 1990s, um, there were some uh, events in both in Europe um, in Western Europe and the UK that I think scared people from animal rights agenda. And there were some things which people just found kind of distasteful. Like there was a campaign against a particular animal lab and one of the kind of straw that broke the camel's back um, tactics was, was unearthing the um, dead, you know, families of the people who they were trying to put pressure on. And people were not okay with that, um, you know, trying to bargain their, their bones back. Um, and so I think that we have a decline in those sorts of things and an upsurge in broad-based popular movements. So Standing Rock is a great example. Um, the encampment against the Mountain Valley Pipeline in West Virginia is, is a good example as well. Um, uh, I think we have more of those. They're more broad-based. Under the Obama administration or the, the tail end of the Obama administration, we got a lot of sympathetic or at least reasonably sympathetic rhetoric coming from the White House about that particular movement. Um, and we also lacked the, the defamatory rhetoric, which we had in the, in the George W. Bush years. So I think people are more open to it. I also, and I, I wrote this in, the, in my chapter in the book, you know, the basic premise of the, the book chapter is everyone's telling us that radical change is, is needed or we're all going to die. So why is breaking the law really a radical response to that, right? If NASA, which is pretty, you know, mainstream, legitimate, you know, entity, if NASA comes out and says, stuff has to change or, you know, we're done for as a species, I don't think that committing a small felony really is a radical response to hearing that we're facing existential existential extinction. Um, but moreover, one of the things, you know, it's, it's sort of a brief part of the chapter, but I look at positive portrayals of, you know, so-called radical environmentalists in the media. And, and, you know, I haven't been tracking this for a long time, but they're definitely increasing. Um, so there's just more and more portrayals of people breaking the law in, you know, in these kind of clandestine networks for, you know, for the environment, for animals. And, and they're not shown as, you know, uh, you know, fringe lunatics. So, you know, one example of this, and I think it's, it's not the best example, but it's maybe one of the more recent, is the Netflix film Okja. People have seen that, where there's this like giant cow pig creature um, that a child befriends and then doesn't want it to be killed. Um, there's a scene where, you know, eco-activists, you know, in balaclavas and, and you know, um, you know, 
take this animal. And again, the fact that that's able to be shown in, in a positive light, I think is something we couldn't have had you know, 20 years ago. There's also kids movies which show you know, things like tree spiking and vehicle sabotage in, in a way that's like positive. And, and I think that it wouldn't have been possible you know, during the height of what we call the green scare. Um, did you want to ask anything else, Zoe? No, no, no. Okay. So, well, Michael, sticking sort of in an inversion of that, um, or so, so just to sort of backtrack to a couple of things that you said about, like, you know, um, going back to the trust issues and, and how activists are very suspicious of um, people infiltrating them for obvious reasons. In, uh, infiltrating their groups. Um, do you also, and I don't know if this is something you want to talk about, but it, it, is it also like a working strategy to infiltrate sort of out groups from the perspective of being involved in <laughs> some sort of, did you get that? Being involved in some sort of um, environmental activism group? So, so my question is, I think I got distracted by right. talking to your kid. Um, but yeah, so it, I know that in other contexts, you study sort of, you infiltrate out groups, right? So right. I'm wondering, is that a strategy at, from the perspective of environmental activism, if that's something that, that you know, is possible to engage in as a, as a strategy to sort of con combat threats to your in-group, so to speak. Does that make sense? Am I make, do you understand what I'm saying? It makes sense. Um, I mean, certainly if, you know, the, the left and the right are constantly infiltrating each other um, and, that, and that's sort of been a cat and mouse game for a long time. So, um, you know, what you're referring to is, is, is leftist networks, you know, infiltrating and focusing on what we call the far right. And, and certainly that's occurring a lot. And there's interesting crossover with far right and environmental stuff we could talk about if we have time. Um, I, I, I haven't seen as much of what you're referring to as I think is, is possible. So for example, you know, in the 90s, it was far more, and even in the 2000s, it was far more common um, for, for example, people to get, you know, whistleblowers to get jobs at Hormel or, you know, Pacific Lumber, you know, some, some corporation and, you know, wear, wear a microphone or a camera and, you know, collect some, you know, evil evidence. Um, this is one of the, the ways in which a lot of evidence was built against Huntington Life Sciences, the large animal lab. Um, I, I don't see a lot of that occurring. Um, certainly it's fictionalized a lot. Uh, a film I like to use in class to just to to show kind of how this is ludicrously filmed, which coincidentally was filmed by a Georgetown University student, um, is a film called The East, which is a really terrible piece of film, um, <laughs> supposed to show uh, anarchist eco saboteur networks being infiltrated by corporate agents, um, and and so there, there's there's frequent portrayal like that. Every like NCIS and Law and Order type show has one episode about this. Like literally every single series has one episode of the eco terrorist, typically modeled somewhere along the Ted Kaczynski, um, the the Unabomber kind of story, um, and he himself has risen in popularity a lot through a Netflix series. Um, so so I, you don't see a lot of it. The closest thing that I that I see, which is really different. So you know besides the you know, lefties who get jobs at Hormel and, and take pictures of people abusing animals and things like that. So outside of that, um, is you have groups that do kind of performance theater about it. So, you know, the one that comes to mind is the Yes Men, if people are familiar or not familiar with them, um, who, you know, basically weasel their way into corporate functions to get invited as representatives of corporations, which they are not actually representatives of, and then use that as a venue to kind of show the absurdity. Um, you know, this is similar to like what the Gorilla Girls did in the 1990s in terms of like combating sexism in the art industry. Um, but outside of, you know, the Sasha Baron Cohen's of the world and the Yes Men of the world, I, I don't see a lot of that. And at least Cohen isn't seemingly focused on that. He's focused on embarrassing conservative politicians, which, which is like a fair thing to be focused on. But, but that's not, you know, he's, he's not go, trying to get into Bechtel corporate meetings and things like that in the way that the, the Yes Men have been. Right, right. Okay, so I'm going to pivot back to you now, Zoe, and sort of talk more about, um, how, again, about sort of maybe messaging, um, how, 
how you're looking at using certain language when you're communicating um, to, to people or groups. Um, um, and, and I know that you, when we talked in the past, Zoe, you were talking about things like um, terminology that you use in messaging, um, like climate change or sustainability. Um, you know, if they're terms that you should, that are effective to be using, or if they're, if they're, um, if they're irrelevant, and if you can communicate things in a way without using that, that terminology to get your message across more effectively? Yeah, well, I think it's really a question of how you frame climate change as being connected to other things people are experiencing. And I think you mentioned earlier the, the fact that often people are dealing with so many different kinds of stressors that they may not prioritize climate change or environmental issues as especially high on the list because Many of the people that are most affected by climate change are dealing with a lot of other cumulative impacts like poverty, unemployment, incarceration, um, other kinds of environmental injustices that aren't directly climate related. So when you just approach it as, you know, climate change is this global issue we should be concerned about, it may not be a top priority for people because they are overburdened by other things. And it's also hard to separate out climate from some of the other challenges. Like I, last year I was doing research in the Central Valley in California, and I was talking to a lot of people who lived in rural areas and whose wells had gone dry during the drought, like four or five years ago. Um, so there are people who had lived without running water for about a year since their wells went dry, um, which was directly a result of climate change. It was the most serious drought in California history. But since their wells um, started to have water in them again, many of those people are still living without running water because the water in their wells is so contaminated by agricultural runoff from the big farms in the Central Valley that they're not able to drink it at all. So the issue of access to water for them is somewhat tied to climate, but it's really inseparable from um, natural resource contamination and the lack of accountability for corporations. And I think that's often the case, you know, many people who are impacted by floods and extreme storms, it's tied to climate because of the frequency of the storms. Um, but it's also related to the histories of segregation and redlining that didn't make it possible for people to live in safer areas or in higher ground areas. So these issues are always overlapping. Um, and the kinds of places that vulnerable people are able to live in are often the most exposed to sea level rise or extreme heat or other climate impacts. So I think the, the climate justice framing beyond just talking about climate change, but really tying it to climate justice and to the other kinds of structural injustices that exacerbate it is really important in communicating. Um, and that's something that I've really learned from Black-led environmental climate justice movements. But I think also just in more practical terms and communicating these issues with people that I work with, it doesn't always make sense to talk about it in terms of climate change, but to talk about the direct impacts that people experience. So if someone is very low income and their roof is blown off by a hurricane multiple times in a couple of years, that has a serious impact on their life because they can't afford to get it fixed and that's taking resources away from other things. So, or people who I met whose wells were going dry like those are the direct impacts on their lives. And I would start the conversation there rather than just with climate change as a larger concept. Right. Um, so I, going back to something Michael said, um, we're all practitioners with academic backgrounds and we're practitioners and we've all sort of been advocates or activists or, you know, done a bunch of stuff um, in, in different areas. Um, Around that, that sort of satellite around that. Um, so as practitioners, and when Michael and I started thinking about putting this book together, we were very clear about one thing. <laughs> if there was one thing we were clear about, it was the fact that we wanted to work with practitioners rather than sort of academics, so to speak. Um, and if we can acknowledge that maybe we're both or we have different experiences in more than one of those things, um, if we talk a little bit more about how how we have 
uh, as practitioners, this unique perspective of engaging with human behaviour and with people um, on, a, on, a, on a very sort of, uh, I don't want to say real level, but on a sort of on the ground level, um, we can provide valuable local insights, right, place-based insights, place -based insights um, a lot of the time. Um, but we can work with, uh, you know, other scholars and academics to sort of develop wider partnerships or coalitions or networked um, uh, transnational organisations, other types of scholars and coalitions that can design and analyse research and produce new insights and uh, maybe... Uh, sort of spot limitations that we have as practitioners or to be able to help secure funding. Um, and so there may be advantages to bringing scholars and practitioners together, so combining um, expertise and, you know, obviously the, the ability to have a real world impact, impact with that or build capacity is sort of most important. Um, but do you find that, that sort of growing these network coalitions. Um, people are maybe interested or theoretically we may be interested in collaborating, but is finding each other and connecting with others who have common interests to bring value to a sort of specific context harder than it might seem? And if so, why? And that's a question to both of you. So Zoe, you're on camera, so maybe you can answer that. <laughs> Oh yeah, it just put me on camera. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, a ton of value to be had from collaborations between practitioners and frontline communities and academics, especially in trying to move policy change because the unfortunate truth is that policymakers are much more responsive to knowledge that comes in a supposedly prestigious package. Um, and I think that should change and community experience should be more valued, but for the time being, researchers can use the prestige or the influence or the networks that they have um, to bring these issues to the attention of people that have the power to change it. I think that one of the challenges in doing kind of community research collaborations effectively is just addressing the inherent power dynamic between researchers and communities. Um, since researchers are often connected to an institution, they may be better funded and just have a little more, um, like I said, access and prestige than the people that they're interacting with. But I think that that can be overcome by trying to be transparent about the resources that are available and making sure that if you're asking people to participate in your research, that they're being compensated for their time as well and that they're part of the decision making about what's being researched and why to make sure that it's actually meeting their goals and it's not just providing material for someone's dissertation that doesn't advance the objectives of the community that's participating. Yeah. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that entirely. As someone who really walks that line really carefully, um, you know, I've really tried my best to not like make hay of a lot of the work a lot of the stories I've, I've, I've learned from activists. So most of my work is really focused on repression, um, you know, partially because it felt kind of uncomfortable to kind of use their stories as a way of, 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 of building my own work. So for example, um, in my, my master's work, you know, is heavily informed by interviews with, um, with members or, or self-described members of the Animal Liberation Front, you know, none of which I published. So I use that to kind of provide background and then so, sort of summarize that background in the study. But, you know, I, I didn't, in a sense, do anything with that. But I think that these sort of partnerships are really essential because there are certain things which, which we're given access to, right? So as, as, a, um, as an activist, we have access to the stories of other activists in ways in which other academics or policymakers may not have. And so, you know, one of the when I think of like who's doing this well, I, I can think of a ton of people who are doing this really poorly. A lot of people who, you know, are very extractive in their work, you know, who kind of like take these sensationalist stories and kind of run with them. Um, there's a lot of a lot of that that's bad. But when I think of people who are doing this well, I think of scholars who I've 
you know, literally run across, you know, in, in the woods, you know, I don't mean like in the woods, like, you know, bird watching, I mean, like in the woods, in, in you know, engage in what they're doing. So um, my family and I, and my, my kids and my partner and I were, um, it was about a year and a half ago, I guess, in the woods, um, facilitating some workshops for um, Earth First, which is a grassroots radical environmental network. Um, and, you know, I, I, won't, I won't name them, but, but I bumped into several, you know, well-credentialed, PhD-holding, well-published academics, you know, who write on these topics. And, you know, were they, you know, were they going undercover to, to learn about the activists? No, this was their, their community. You know, in a sense, they were they were developing material to help them write autoethnographically. They were writing about themselves in the context of these movements. It wasn't this kind of parachute in, learn something sensationalist, extract it, remove it, and you know, b build your career on that. Right? That kind of careerism is is really not great. Um, it, it's very inherently exploitive and, and always privileges people with with institutional power. Um, you know, one of the reasons I think I've been able to navigate that is that you know, for better or worse, and arguably it's for worse, you know, I've been, I'll say, devoid of stable job security for most of my life. So I think if you, if you have a real stable position, it's easier to kind of feel that security as a blanket, which allows you to engage. But I think for those of us that live in contingent economies or, you know, are, are, are forced to be in the gig economy, it, we're, we're pretty aware of, of, of not, for lack of a better word, burning our sources. You know, I don't want to burn my colleagues and my and my activist friends because we work together constantly. So I, I, I try and maybe as my approach to summarize my approach to be as non-extractive as I can and to build relationships. So I try to create research which is of direct use, of direct use to social movements. So for example, the, the master's work I described about the animal liberation front, I did and then provided to um, people who work defending those those individuals, and, and I and I did that work so that we could have that data for defense. So I think one of the ways we can do that is to kind of, again, speak to communities and actually provide them, you know, in uh, resources. And, and I don't mean money, though. I think money is often very helpful. But if a community needs a study of a particular oppositional group or of a particular resource, you know, we are in the the privileged ability to do that for some of these these communities. And so I'm very much in favor of that. Yeah, my, myself uh, as well, I, I think I spoke about this in the last panel that um, we were on um, about some work that I did on uh, with um, Janine with Navajo Nation um, around uh, the 30th anniversary of the Church Rock spill and um, how we facilitated a whole lot of work that was helping people build their resources to tell their own stories about environmental injustice uh, around this, this uh, you know, the, the third largest um, radioactive spill outside of Chernobyl and, and Fukushima. And at that point in time, because it was back in like 10 years ago now, it was before Fukushima. And um, these sort of like abandoned uranium mines that, you know, kick around the southwest and with you know, tail, tailings blowing in the wind and Indigenous families living next to them and, you know, surviving on less than $300 a year with absolutely no resources to really, you know, get any attention, even a health impact study from, you know, these radioactive spills or these, you know, unreclaimed uranium mines and that sort of thing. So we had a, a bit of money that we put towards sort of this storytelling project where part of what we did was um, go out with, uh, with, this, with, with this sort of group, these groups um, on the 30th anniversary of that Church Rock spill and, uh, you know, went out with cameras and, tried to to help them tell a story about their experiences in connection with a, um, a, a health research network and an indigenous um, sort of activist uh, coalition and together we were able to create enough buzz around this event that um, it 
got a New York Times story and eventually got in front of Congress and they got the funding 30 years later for the first health impact study. So that's a long way of saying some of the work that I've done in the past is also about how to try and build resources that support communities to tell their own stories to get the work done that they need to do. I agree with you completely. I think we all do. And Zoe and I work together in Brazil. We'd often see people parachuting in to do try and work on really bizarre um, sort of projects with us. <laughs> and um, so I think we're all familiar with 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 that sort of you know, someone coming in and being completely out of touch with what's going on. I mean, in that scenario, I worked in that on Navajo Nation with people for several years, as, as I did with Zoe in Brazil. So I think we're, we all understand that commitment to, to sort of like an authentic or some sort of ethical foundation for the work that we do. And that being said, so, so scientific information may matter, right? Like in, that, in the context I was just talking about, we're trying to gather data for for a legal defence. Uh, so you said, Michael, and for me, I was trying to sort of, you know, create a, a result with a health impact study and a, and a, and a mine cleanup, uranium mine cleanup. And um, so presenting scientific evidence may matter, but it doesn't always matter. And sometimes it, uh, it, it has a boomerang effect and people, have, have a, a sort of a, a knee-jerk reaction against it. So there's, there's ways of framing issues that are, are about storytelling or emotional connections or connections to nature or environmental degradation or to non-humans or sentient beings that can increase public support for a position and actually move to res a result from that perspective. So... Um, and I'm sure in what you what you do, Michael, in particular with your work with animal advocacy, um, that that's a big um, that's a big part of um, what drives people, and also the the results that you, you're looking for come, I imagine, probably more from an emotional connection to the subject rather than a sort of data related um, data related information that you can give people but that may not be the case because I've also heard you talk about data and how important that is in pitching a sort of an argument certainly about like eco-activism and and non-violence in relation to how it's portrayed in in the media and these in, by these institutions do you want to say talk I, a little bit about that sure I mean I, I think it's, it's a it's a fine line to, to walk right um, you know I'm very much in against the um, um, sensationalism, right? So, you know, and, and I, you know, I don't, and I write enough that people can like verify this claim. <laughs> like I don't start anything I write with some, you know, deep dystopian portrayal of where we're at. You know, and some people do, and I think that can be effective. You know, certainly writing about animal issues, people can start the chapter with, you know, by the time you finish reading this sentence, you know, X number of billions of animals are killed for human consumption. You could write like that. I, I don't. Um, but but I do think that the data. So so I think that there's the kind of the data to overwhelm strategy, which is kind of that. But I I do use it to show, for example, empirical backing to rhetorical claims. Right. That's a big, mm -hmm. a big part of my work. And so right. I say, for example, just to keep it on the same topic that I was speaking of earlier. If I say, despite their framing by the FBI. I do not believe that the Animal and Earth Liberation Front should be classified as terrorist organizations, despite the fact they're not organizations. We can put that aside for a minute. Um, but, if, but if I want to contest their framing as terroristic, you know, I need data for that. The FBI's data you know, would say that 75% of their actions involve terrorism. Well, that's only true if you only count you know, the acts of terrorism. So, so let me put something out that, that's somewhat obvious, but, but I think it's worth thinking about for a second. The FBI and the media um, base their analysis on prominent incidents. So large scale arsons, the theft or release of animals, uh, damage to laboratories, et cetera. What they don't account for are all of the small acts of vandalism, sabotage, and other things. 
So when you only look at the sensational, you discount the mundane and thus overinflate the occurrence of the sensational. In other words, if you look at the movement as an aggregate, you can find that you know, so-called terrorism, so for example, sending uh, explosive devices to, to lab technicians or setting, you know, putting some, uh, incendiary devices in the personal automobiles or boats of, of um, board members of companies. You know, I think many people would argue that those are very terroristic. Those things occur, but they occur in minuscule quantities, right? Single digits, you know, one to 2% over the last 30 years. Um, so it's not to say that that doesn't occur, but it is to say that to classify a movement, uh, a global movement by its 1% tendency is, is inaccurate. And so I use data to make those sorts of claims because I mean, who are you to, you know, who am I to be believed uh, as opposed to the FBI? You know, why would anyone believe my data versus the FBI's? Well, for one, my data is transparent. I'll show you every single incident that's ever occurred, the date, location, et cetera. And, and that's been my strategy. As I say, like, I know I'm arguing against giant stoic institutions with large institutional memory. And I'm just this guy. So like, here's all the data, like here's literally 80 pages of appendices showing every single chart you can imagine. You can look at the data any way you want. So, so, I've, so I've tried to balance providing people with quantitative data to back up the rhetorical claims I've made. And I've tried to balance that with, with what you spoke of earlier, the emotive. Um, and, and, you know, I really try to, like I said, avoid the kind of, in, in, in my small subculture of, of um, we have a term which is probably not used outside of my subculture called riot porn. Um, this is like, you know, people who collect and circulate images of, you know, riots, yeah. things on fire and broken things. Um, you know, a similar concept is, is poverty porn. The, the two words together are somewhat jarring. But, you know, I try to avoid that. You know, the like pictures of small children, typically who are not white, typically who are not in so-called first, first world nations, who, you know, look sad and marginalized. You know, I, I don't, I don't do that. Um, yeah. In our field, we could do a lot of that. And so I think the careful balance between enough data to convince and enough real human voices to talk about actual effects. But, but I really try not to play on the latter because I think it can be inherently very exploitive. Um, yeah. Like yeah. disaster porn, that sort of Disaster thing. porn is probably better than poverty porn, but yeah. Um, but, and I wanted to, to circle back to one of the things that, that Zoe had said and, and, ask, and ask her, you know, what you said is really, what you said about kind of audiences and people's abilities is really interesting. The idea that, for example, if someone's experiencing multiple forms of marginalization, it's hard for them to focus on structural change, right? So if we're trying to get people to talk about, you know, revamping the, the water system in, 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 in this country, it's certainly hard if those people are also experiencing poverty, mass incarceration, et cetera. So my, my question was, you know, how do you kind of adjust your, your, your language or your rhetoric or your framing or how you kind of begin those arguments in order to allow people to hear what you're trying to say. In other words, like, have you found any effective strategies to kind of cut through the, the other layers of trauma in order to focus on how to mitigate the particular trauma that you're trying to focus on in this case? let's say water availability or safe water availability. Yeah, I mean, maybe I didn't put it right earlier. Like I, th I think that the movements for water justice and for environmental change that are most effective are usually led by the people who are most affected and who are experiencing all those different forms of marginalization. So I think it's not necessarily that people yeah, how do, so people are very overstressed, but um, I do think th those are the movements that are operating most effectively and that generally have the best tactics. But I think just approaching those conversations with an awareness of the trauma that people are dealing with and not just assuming because this is an infrastructure issue that it's something kind of boring and technical and that it's not connected to people's day-to-day -day lives and survival. Um, I think that's a, a more effective way to have the conversation. I'm not sure if that answers your question. It, it does. I mean, for, for me, it's, 
I mean, I'm, I'm personally interested because I, as I said before, I'm always talking to different kinds of audiences. And, you know, frequently, you know, especially if you're talking to people who see themselves as, as, as marginalized, whether or not that, a lot of times what I, what I hear when I talk to people about this or, or other issues is like, I don't have time for that. I'm worried where I'm going to pay my rent next week, or I don't have time for that. Mm-hmm. You know, my house is on fire, you know, metaphorically. And I, and I, I get that. Like, uh, so, so what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to get may, maybe selfishly is like, what have you found is effective because it seems like since you're so, since you're primarily focused on something like water, um, it's a particular challenge. Because as you said, it's mysterious. It comes out of the tap until it mm-hmm. doesn't. Um, it's not something we think about being available. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's all about partnering with the people who are already water justice advocates and who understand the way that it affects their communities. Um, And a lot of people that I work with don't really intend to go into water. They don't uh, plan that at the start of their career, but they end up finding it through other kinds of challenges. Like I worked with someone who runs a food bank in West Virginia, and she never really expected water to become a key issue, but she found that bottled water was the most requested item that she got above food or household stuff or anything else. So through that, she started to realize how many people were living without running water or with highly contaminated tap water that they couldn't drink. And through that, she's become a really powerful water advocate. Um, but I think people often, the water, what, the water crisis comes to them. And they already have an understanding of the kinds of injustices that the community is facing. And then they see how water fits into it. So following their lead and how they frame it is usually helpful. Thank you. That's super helpful. Lee, did you have about? Uh, other- I have a couple of questions left, but I'm also aware that it's 3.30 and that we we have only to go until four o'clock. But maybe I'll just I'll just um, put a couple of things out there in case you'd like to comment and um, uh, and then you know we can we can sort of turn it over to people if they have questions. But w- one of the things that I, I wanted to ask was, you know, we've just been discussing trauma. So um, how does trauma affect us? Personally, I mean, Michael, when we first started doing this book idea, you know, developing the book idea, it was related to trauma as practitioners in the work that we do. And even though this is a sort of maybe a little one step removed, um, the stuff that we've just been talking about, but when we're looking at um, the traumas that we face or the communities that that we interact with face, um, you know, whether their houses are burning down or the roofs are getting blown off or, you know, they've run out of water or they're facing all these slew of other other issues that, that um, Zoe was and you were just talking about um, or just the general malaise that we all feel because we see our planet slipping away from us, so the health of our planet. How do these sorts of traumas affect us and how or you guys really uh how how do you remain active rather than paralyzed by this trauma and how much does empathy or the need for emotional support from your communities or um play into sort of keeping you active and whole in the work that you do sure i can i can speak to that um I mean, certainly, as you said, you know, when 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 Lee and I started this book, you know, it was about trauma. I think we had both. I actually found that outline we had made a couple weeks ago when we did the other talk, and uh, we had originally called it "From Bethlehem to Brazil." And right. we were going to talk about work I was doing in the Middle East, and you were going to talk about work you were doing in Brazil. Um, I think what came to mind for both of us was, um, you know, what people like Galton called direct violence. You know, muggings and murder and police violence and military violence. We we're going to talk about that and how trauma informs activism, and then it morphed into what we have. In, in a sense, my my chapter didn't morph. You know, like I took the lazy way out and thinking about that. Maybe I just made that connection in this moment. But you know, my chapter is, is still about that. You know, I was really um, focused on how trauma informs activism, and and it's not something that I had gone into thinking, right? I think 
when I think of a kind of archetypal eco actor, when I think of an Edward Abbey if, or someone like that, if, if that's a name that rings a bell, or um, you know, someone like Judy Berry, I think of them coming from a place of joy. I think of them coming from a, I want to preserve this for my children. Um, I want to show people the beauty of the natural world. Um, you know, certainly there is a sense of loss in it, no question. But when I really got into it, right, when I really started reading literally thousands of claims of responsibility for people who had engaged in sabotage and vandalism, you know, what I found is that the overwhelming majority of them spoke of, of loss and of trauma, you know, real, real trauma. And people spoke of a sort of indescribable sense of, of, of sinking, right? This idea that they were trying to preserve something which they themselves knew full well they could not preserve. Like, you know, just so we're clear, if an activist, um, you know, puts glue in the locks of a bulldozer in order to prevent that bulldozer from felling trees, that activist is not under the false impression that by stopping this particular bulldozer for six to eight hours, that they are going to undo climate change. No one thinks that, right? Just like, no, no, one's, no one thinks that. So for, for, for a lot of people, you know, when I really spoke to them and when I read their writing, it wasn't, I'm doing this to prevent these trees from being felled. It was, I'm doing this because if I don't do this, I can't live with myself. If I, if I don't do this, I won't feel okay that I didn't take a stand. And, and I don't want that to be heard as, 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 as selfish or self, self-serving. I don't mean that. What I mean is that activists are engaged in risky actions not because they think that that action is going to be the tipping point, but because they feel obliged to engage. They feel obliged to play a, an active role in, in you know, what we can call an eco war, what we can call a climate crisis or, or whatever. But, but again, I want to underscore that they don't feel an obligation as a martyr. They, you know, I'm sure some do, but overwhelmingly, they, they don't see that as a martyr and they don't see that as like an anger, an anger point. You know, I, I kind of expected to find more anger. What I really found was sadness and loss and people, you know, people reminiscing about things that they hadn't yet lost, but knew they would lose. So, you know, people walking through a, a field and saying like, I'm here defending this field because I know that one day soon this field won't exist. Like the field exists, I'm in it, but I know soon it won't exist. And so I'm taking a stand. So this kind of sort of preemptive preemptive avoidance of future trauma is like the most common recourse and chorus I see throughout all of these writings. Zoe, I have a, a last question for you um, to do with, um, you know, uh, well, to do with the mainstream environmental movement um, and sort of and counter narratives to that and touched on things like, well, uh, earlier when we were speaking about, um, you, you know, sort of how, how many uh, sort of mainstream conservation and preservation organisations or other forms of environmental sort of organisations are, are shaped by race and class and gender. And a lot of the times, we touched on this in the book as well, but, you know, a lot of NGOs are employerless you know, lots, uh, very few people of colour, there's a green ceiling of white privilege, there's like non-white, non-hetero, non-university educated biases, non-wealthy, there's a huge gap between white environmentalism and, and the other when it comes to the Indigenous environmental struggle. Um, you know, tribal voices of historically been left out of decision making processes relating to their affairs since you know forever um it's been termed apartheid ecology and the the sort of counter uh organizing that's come with that has galvanized uh, the type of environmental justice activism embraced by people of colour and the dispossessed and those living on reservations and the poor to develop activist agendas and sort of subaltern um, organi organising strategies 
um, that link racism and oppression to a lack of access to resources and territorial struggles and human rights and violations. So how else do you see sort of polarisation or galvanisation manifesting in, in environmental efforts or movements? Yeah, well, it's interesting. When you told me the premise for this panel, um, I was just trying to think about how polarization fits into environmental movements. And on the surface, environmental movements are generally associated with the left, like with Democrats, with liberals, progressives. Um, and they're, they're seen as being broadly aligned with that side of the political spectrum. But I think there are a lot of undercurrents in the mainstream environmental movement that are very right-wing and conservative. Um, and I think the biggest one is just that the kind of mainstream environmental movement is operating from the assumption that essential systems can continue in the way that they are now. And this is especially true with climate change. It's a little bit different with conservation organizations, but there's this assumption that our capitalist consumerist society is not the, the problem and that we don't need to make fundamental changes to how we live and work and consume. And that if we just make some tweaks to the energy sources that we use and the way that we pollute, that we can still maintain this lifestyle with all of the inequality that comes alongside it. Um, and I think that's an extremely conservative, reactionary, right-wing, whatever you wanna call it, position. Um, mm -hmm. But it's difficult to talk about when politically, it's always espoused by the left. Um, so I think any kind of discussion of climate change or of pushing back against the environmental destruction that we're living with, that's not directly tied to critiques of capitalism and inequality and really racial capitalism and colonialism in the US are fundamentally not left and not just. Mm -hmm. um, and that's true to some extent with water policy as well. It's something that we never really talk about or think about, but the kind of society that we live in requires a level of industrial production and resource consumption that is inevitably gonna result in contamination and destruction of water resources. So that's just a fundamental paradox that no amount of equitable policy can overcome. Um, and I think that's something really challenging about the Green New Deal framework, because as much as I politically support it and I hope it gains political traction, it's another approach to climate change that doesn't change any fundamental structure that has created um, the circumstances that lead to the destruction of, of our environment. And I think the fact that mainstream environmental movements bought in so hard to the idea of individual choices as the most important level of environmental change, um, which again, I think was really propagated by oil companies and corporations, like using the framework of the carbon footprint to really focus it all on the individual rather than systemic change. Environmentalists are kind of moving away from that now and realizing that that position doesn't work, but it's been used for a long time to exacerbate the kind of racist, classist inequalities in the environmental movement and to place blame on individuals for their choices, like blaming someone for driving a car a lot without looking at why they're doing that. Maybe they can't afford to live close to where they work. Why is their job there? Why has their city been designed around cars? Um, so it's a way to avoid having the more difficult conversations about how society is structured. And then I think just as you said, the kind of undervaluing of Black and Indigenous environmental activism in the mainstream movement, which is now moving more towards kind of fetishization of looking at Indigenous movements as something that will save the planet, but without actually valuing the lives of Indigenous people or really supporting their movements. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael, before before I hand it back to you, would you like to, well, I will hand it back to you and just ask, um, is there anything else you'd like to add um, as I turn it back to you on, on the topic of positive peace? I think that's what you started with and we haven't really discussed that directly. I agree with what Zoe is saying. Um, 
And, and certainly I think that we have a challenge of elevating voices without exploiting voices, with centering people without showing them as, as inherently, you know, being, um, ha having the solution. I think that that's a, that's a hard, it's a hard thing to navigate. And it's certainly what, what we're seeing a lot of now, especially from NGO communities. Um, the other, the other kind of piece to this, just talking about, um, I was really struck by, by the way Zoe began the idea that, you know, one of the challenges we face is the idea that like the environment is like a left thing. And like, that's a weird notion. And like the pushback to that, um, which, is, which is still small, but certainly the coronavirus is making it like a lot worse, is this kind of uh, eco-fascist kind of side of that, this like, wow, look, no, no one's, you know, driving to work. Look, the rate of pollution is down. See, the virus is the solution, right? Like, you know, you've seen, maybe you haven't, but people don't, don't, don't. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> but I've seen a lot of this discussion of the kind of like the earth is healing itself. Like finally, like, you know, the, the plague of humanity is giving the earth a break. Um, you know, it moves into like social Darwinism, you know, the like, um, you know, certainly when certain members of the political administration have advocated um, so-called herd immunity that, I, you know, they've said that, but I've, you know, I, what I've heard from, from, from them saying that is um, you know this survival of the fittest? Like yeah, you know some of the immunocompromised and elder people. Yeah, they're gonna die, but like we just gotta do that for the common good. But like that is like a pretty textbook definition of social Darwinism and and and, um, and ecofascism. The other thing you see within the ecofascist discourse, which is which is really rising in, in popularity in the last few years, is this idea that like returning to something, which I think is a false construct, and, and it's really challenging. Mm -hmm because the left uses it sometimes too, right? Like we need to get back to simpler ways. It's like, oh, okay, but a, you know, like it's not quite that simple, right? I mean, um, you know, many people smarter than myself have pointed out the ways in which industrial society is, is you know, makes itself um, I irreplaceable, right? Like, you know, the, the car is a great example, right? And this is, you know, this is a common argument, but you know, you can choose not to use a car up until the point at which your town is bisected by highways and then you're kind of out of luck. Um, prior to that, sure, you can ride a horse or you can walk, but you know, once the world has been constructed a certain way. So, so, so what I'm saying is that I think that's a fundamental challenge that we have is how do you get people who don't identify as members of the left or, or even the progressive left to talk about something like this, one. And two, is that how do you push back on the notion that uh, a decrease in human consumption of fossil fuels and mass transportation is, is actually not the way in which it's being explained, right? So, so the idea that like the virus, the coronavirus has given us a chance to heal and thus, you know, like I, I, don't, I don't buy that rhetoric. And I think that's really, really, really dangerous rhetoric, especially if we're trying to protect marginalized people. Um, and again, as, 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 as Zoe said, you know, marginalized people who are marginalized through environmental injustice will almost always map over top of people who are marginalized through economic injustice, racial injustice, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that is a so sort of fundamental problem that we face. And also, I guess the, the, the fact that we're not talking about certain things, like it's the environmental destruction that's that can be linked directly to, you know, more zoonotic outbreaks of viruses, right? So unless we sort of, you know, start to restore our, our natural environments, then we're more likely to, to have more occurrences of these types of really critical issues that we face with coronavirus. It's yeah. Our future. For sure that these things are linked, right? There's, there's no... There's no way you can have an informed discussion of a global health pandemic without talking about the environment. And, and the fact that we are having those discussions without talking about the environment is, is, is silly. Um, you know, and it sort of goes to what Zoe's saying about not, not discussing the underlying structural problems with sort of perpetual growth and consumption that's so out of control. Right, or like, you know, I think of, um, I think of someone like Murray Bookchin, who, whose work I really liked, and I had the, the benefit of studying with Murray prior to his death. Um, but you know, Murray Bookchin wrote in the 1970s, I think like in 1972, 
um, a piece called Post Scarcity Anarchism, which you know basically advocated that like we as a society can use technology to reach a point at which we remove some of the drudgery and are able to live in a post scarcity environment. And you know to summarize a, a brilliant piece in, in a, a few sentences. You know, he basically says that, you know, the, the problem there is capitalism, that capitalism requires scarcity, right? And, and this is not, you know, this, this, is, this is not new theory, but the idea of, you know, of, of, of capitalism needing to perpetuate false scarcity in order to, to control profit, right? Like, I don't think it's a radical assertion to say that we can't have an environmentally sustainable world under the present economic conditions. Like, that shouldn't be a radical assertion. But, but I think it's often understood as such. And so to put it very simply, I don't think we can have, you know, uh, a sustainable world under, under neoliberal capitalism. And I think that until that, that assertion is kind of swallowed wholesale by mainstream society, we're not gonna be able to make fundamental change. And we'll go back to what Zoe was saying, which is, you know, people being told to, to change their lifestyles. Like, is, like I, I'm vegan, my kids are vegan, the, the, you know, like, but, but I do that for my own reasons. I don't do that because I think that that's like shutting down the, you know, cattle industry, you know, if you tell people don't drive, ride a bike, that's awesome. It's great for your cardiovascular health. It's great for all sorts of things, but it's not going to change any of this. Like to put that on consumers is really uh, intentionally, I think, unfair and, and a bit disingenuous. Which is sort of hard to put it on people without offering any alternatives. Like right. if you're telling people to ride a bike, but you're not providing affordable housing in areas where they're close enough to the things they need to go. Or you have a city like I live in Cincinnati, and like we have like we have such a pathetic public transportation system that you know it just it just it's you know for me to go four miles from my house to the university or three miles from my house to the university on the bus takes an hour and twenty minutes. I could walk that in less time. You know, it's just not realistic to tell people who are struggling economically like oh just build in another three hours a day to your commute, right? So it's not about a desire to bike or a desire to take the bus or a desire to drive. It's about like what you need to do to like make ends meet. And this is where we go back to the, the, the incongruency between fundamental change and, and capitalism. I think it's very complex. And I think it's very complex for people to understand that haven't been schooled in this complexity of, you know, intersecting issues um, for, you know, when, when all that all we've been schooled in from, you know, like b being in the United States from childhood upwards is about consumption and living large and consuming more and having more stuff and new stuff and, and material material things. And even the ways that we look at the, this, you know, what we've just been talking about, the, 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 we talk about renewable energy because we can produce material items that you know come from extractive industries we don't talk about weatherization of homes in the same way that we talk about these sort of technological solutions because they don't provide the same sort of growth opportunities um you know saying so that 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 something like our obsession with the re renewable energy does even though it's valuable but um anyway that's all right nothing else Did you want to ask, turn it over to some people to talk before we jump off, Michael? Yeah, I mean, we had um, we have some questions which came through in the chat, um, but um, Jeremy had jumped off. He had posted a few questions here, um, but let, let's we let's open it up. We have about ten minutes. Um, I know that I was reading through some of the questions that some of my students were sending me. I wasn't able to kind of bring them forth, but if if someone wants to offer a question to our to our you know, to myself, Lee, um, or Zoe, uh, this would be an appropriate time to do so. And you can unmute yourself and speak or raise your hand and I can call on you, whatever makes your life simple. Yeah, Julia, feel free. Thanks, sorry, I'm having an issue with my camera, but um, I was wondering, and this can just be like a general question for whoever might wish to answer it but especially um in the past year one of my housemates is from new orleans in louisiana and they've been experiencing just non-stop hurricanes and severe weather um uh 
kind of issues that are, of course, being exacerbated by climate change. And so um, I was kind of thinking of how, you know, conservatives often try to avoid taking a real stance on climate change by denying or questioning the proof of human caused climate change. Um, but I was wondering if you think that will continue to be a sustainable argument for them, um, considering the kind of increased na- d- uh, intensity of climate related disasters, especially in like conservative states and areas like Florida, Louisiana, and Texas. Thank you. I, I mean, I, I think Zoe and, and Lee are probably in a better position to answer this, but the only thing I would add or point out is that it seems like going back to polarization that we as a country, specifically looking at the last presidential debates, the, the debates in the presidential race, which we just are just experienced. Um, is that there does appear to be a bit of an in-group, out-group that was developed and fostered during that time between you know, so-called climate skeptics and so-called climate advocates. Um, to me, that, that's not unique, but it was, seemed very uh, exaggerated in the presidential debates, you know, where, where you know, if you'll recall, if you, if you stomached them, that there were a couple times, I think in both debates, um, or, but at least one of the presidential debates, where the moderator you know, said to them, you know, said to both candidates, can you you know, go on record and, and say that climate change is caused by humans, you know, the human, <laughs> human caused climate change. Actually, I think it came up in the vice presidential debate as well. And the fact that that question is asked to a mainstream politician when 99% of scientists, you know, have a consensus shows that that is part of the polarization, the fact that that's a controversial point. And I can speak to that a little bit. I mean, I discussed this quite a lot in one of the previous panels, uh, how the United States is in a really unique position when it comes to climate change denial. But that is, the numbers are starting to go up. Um, Incrementally, more and more people are starting to believe in climate change. And there's now 70% of people that think in some form that climate change is happening. About 50% of people in the United States think it's, it's they're pretty sure it's happening. <laughs> and I'm not, I can't quite remember what the number for it being anthropogenically induced is. Of course, that's lower still. But a lot of it ties again to this sort of like these polarized world views of, you know, um, sort of you, you know, Christian groups and that sort of thing in the world views that are sort of held about that. And and even though that the climate change is becoming more of a recognized issue here, and there's other there's other countries like Australia's pretty bad with climate change denialism and the UK is as well, but the United States sort of stands alone. But as you were saying, uh, as more and more sort of, you know, sunny day flooding happens and more hurricane frequency, more fires, and it starts to become less and less deniable. Um, And as we change our political leadership, you know, the difference between Trump and Biden um, gaining power and and how they frame that gets back to elite polarisation, right? People tending to follow what their leaders say, especially you know, when it comes to environmental protection. So if we start to see climate change acknowledged not as a question, but as a thing that is happening without that question attached to it, then we'll start to see more movement with, with, with less of that questioning going on about, okay, well, yeah, it exists, but is it really human caused? I don't know. There'll be less about that and there'll just be more. That'll be taken as a given more and more as we move forward. But that you know that's dependent largely on our on our on our national political um, stage that we're setting as we speak. So, would you have anything to add to that? Only thing I would add to that is that I agree with all of that, and at the local level, I'm still optimistic because a lot of climate change adaptation and response is done by local governments. And so they have the ability to do that, whether or not their state or their president acknowledges climate change. So in terms of mitigation and cutting emissions, it is really important that we have recognition of climate change at the national level, but for responding to things like hurricanes and making changes to keep people safer and make neighborhoods more resilient, 
that can all be done at the local level, regardless of whether it's acknowledged or not. Yeah, the action starts at the local and the state level. But the, the general framing, the acknowledgement of the actual, is it real? Is it is it real and is it anthropologically induced? Um, as more as that starts to happen on a national level, so it, it's it's going to be flows of the the rhetoric, the national rhetoric, and the sort of the the local to state level actions that sort of coalesce to make the whole conversation. Thank you. Um, we have maybe have time for one more question. Um, JJ, did you have a question? I saw your hand up. Uh, yeah, I wasn't sure how much time we had left. So um, if you don't have to completely, I guess, answer the whole thing. Um, but Zoe, you mentioned something that I guess, Michael, you kind of went off of it later. Um, and yeah, so this kind of like relates to that. So um, I think you both kind of mentioned this idea of that climate justice, that climate change obviously it's a global phenomenon that everyone is experiencing it in some way, shape or form. But oftentimes you have to appeal towards like the individual, like how is this directly impacting you in order to get people to get on the train, get on traction. And so kind of in that sense, I guess my, my question's kind of framed around. So oh, with, as we know, there is like environmental racism, there is class and there are many, many barriers preventing people from being quote unquote environmentalists. And I guess how like people who are privileged who don't really have to bear the grunt of what is happening, how is like, I guess the use, I don't know how to phrase this in a better way. How is the use of like egocentricism making climate justice more appealing for um, particularly people in power to get yeah, on the wagon and um do we have to focus so much on how climate injustices focus on like the individual impacts instead of like the collective converging global crisis and like why do we have to focus so much on like well if this doesn't impact me directly then i'm not going to do anything about it and i guess that's kind of just a phenomenon of capitalism like do does the individual impact of like this happening outweigh the profits that i could gain um, especially if it's not going to impact me. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a bit of a complicated question, but um, yeah, that's where I'm at. Thank you, JJ. Do Lee or Zoe, do you want to have a crack at that? I'm digesting your question. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I'm not sure what to say to that. <laughs> I mean, is that is is that? Um, I think it's uh, it's many questions and it's many considerations. And I think the 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 suite of questions that you've just posed is is also a sort of a suite of answers, right? Like it's not what I was just saying is a climate climate issues and climate justice are not there's so much there's so many multifaceted aspects to them what Zoe was talking about you know impacts on the ground and when we're talking about national and state level actions and whether or not you know who's in charge frames the conversation and um whether it's policy response or ground up response, whether consumers are taking uh, responsibility or whether it's corporate responsibility, whether we're framing things in terms of carbon footprints or trying to communicate how we have to change our paradigms and our, and our consumer lifestyles and how do we do all that without creating a sort of a robust education framework that engages th critical thinking around that and that's happening in other countries I think that's a sort of an important thing that we we touched on but how do we how do we embed that in our in in our youth growing up that that climate change is a is is part of everyday life and um 
and it's not something that's abstract or something that's separate and it's not something that one portion of society deals with and other portions don't and it's putting people in charge of their own uh, destinies around it too I mean you've got places in Europe that I mean everybody grows up talking about sustainability because it's you know they're, they're leaps and heads abound leaps and bounds ahead of where we are here you've got whole countries running on renewables you've got community-owned microgrids you've got people addressing sort of climate injustice as a policy level and mass transit um that that you know built into like master master plans for whole cities and that's the seamless sort of integration with the way that you pay for it or it's free and that sort of thing so there's many many ways of sort of addressing these crises that it's pretty hard to reduce down to small the small answer or concise answer. Does that make sense or am I off topic there? Yeah, no, it does. I guess it's, I don't know, just, <laughs> I know it's a huge question. It's kind of just a ton of questions. I guess I was kind of thinking like, does that kind of lessen the cause if we have to appeal to, well, how does this affect me instead of just, it's the right thing to do, if that makes sense. Um, which yeah, is what I think I get what you're saying. And I wonder if, you know, there are people who live more privileged lives and aren't personally affected, even though climate change affects the whole planet, some people have a lot more ability to insulate themselves from that and to prepare for how it's gonna hit them and to bounce back. Um, so convincing those people that it's right and it's just to care about it and to care about other people and not prioritize their comfort or their profits, that may be work that's worthwhile, but it may also be more effective to put our energy and our resources towards supporting frontline groups that are working against those people or challenging how much power they have in deciding what happens next. So I think all strategies are needed, but just supporting the movements that are working towards addressing climate change may be more worthwhile than trying to sway those people who are really focused on their self-interest. I, I will say that a lot of the students that I work with don't have a very good grasp on what climate change is and they don't necessarily understand what it means. And they certainly don't understand what it means for them. And as we were talking in a, in a previous panel about climate change messaging and visual forms of messaging, you know, people still really respond to polar bears on melting ice because they get it's a climate change thing, but they don't understand what that means. All they understand is this is a story about climate change. I'm looking at a polar bear sitting on melting ice and it's making me really sad. But that's over there. It's not where I am. I'm in Florida. I might get hit by a hurricane, but there's these sort of fundamental disconnects, right? We're sort of not really capable of understanding that it is affecting all of us all the time. I mean, this, this tropical storm Etta hit Miami yesterday and everybody was underwater. That's meant to happen 100 days of the year in Miami in the next five years. So, uh, you know, and yet a lot of those people experiencing those impacts don't put it together with climate change. And I think that goes back to what Zoe was saying is that, you know, if, if the, the roof blows off their house in the hurricane, they want to fix their roof, you know. So even if they are aware in a tangential way that this is climate change related, they want to fix the impacts for themselves, we don't have the capacity yet on a larger framework to talk about a coordinated response, suites of responses to something. So I don't think it's necessarily about people caring or not. I think it's just more about putting frameworks in place so that action, those actions are moving forward in, in suites and in conversations that deal with the issue rather than you know and and as we start doing everything around it those ideas start to change thank you um i want to thank folks for joining us today we went a little 
uh, a little over time, but that's that's fine. This is clearly something people um, respond to. And so uh, I want to thank you for joining us today as part of the Peace and Justice Studies Association conference and invite you to uh, look at some of the other sessions we have going throughout November. Um, we have uh, sessions throughout the month ending with a closing keynote um, from a very interesting individual. So I would very much encourage you to, to check that out. Thank you.